This CPA Australia's live webinar today will be presented by Peter Agardi and Marianne Barker. Chairing this webinar is Tricia Evan Trudeau, Manager of Public Practice Support Services at CPA Australia. Also supporting in the chat box today, we are also joined by Michelle Webb and Sharon Miles. Now to start us off, I'm just going to welcome Tricia into the conversation. Just opening up your mic there. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, Linda. Um, thank you everyone for attending this webinar today. Our two speakers are Peter Agardi and Marianne Barker, who are nationally accredited barrister mediators and are members of the Victorian Bar Dispute Resolution Committee. Peter holds a Bachelor of Commerce and Master of Laws. He, works as an, he worked as an auditor with Deloitte for a year and was a partner in a firm of solicitors before joining the bar in May 2003. Peter is well known for his, in, his insolvency expertise and is the author of two books, Risky Business, What Happens to Personal Assets When Business Fails, and one just hot off the press, Trading Trust Explained. Peter's other main area of expertise is commercial disputes, and he has been appointed mediator in a wide range of disputes. Peter is a member of the Victorian Association for Restorative Justice, and further, Peter was a tax agent who played a significant role in the financial lives of his clients. My oh, sorry, his father. Sorry about that. Yes, his father was. Um, Peter is presenting with Marianne Barker. Marianne holds a Bachelor of Eco Economics and a Bachelor of Laws from Monash University and a Master of Laws from Melbourne University. She was an assistant accountant in the tax section of KPMG and then a solicitor before joining the bar. Marianne's expertise is in mediation and alternative dispute resolution, general commercial law and intellectual property, trade practices and sports law. She is the president of the Taekwondo Appeals Tribunal. She was a senior associate of Cause Chambers Wesker and she's been at the bar for 25 years. She is an author on intellectual property for LexisNexis and is a member of the business law section of the Law Council of Australia. So this webinar will cover your ethical obligations in the case of a dispute, contractual matters and resolution mechanisms, typical disputes and some case scenarios. We will address your questions at the end of the formal presentation and now I'll hand over to Peter to get us started. Welcome Peter. Thank you. We will speak to you today about ethical and other difficulties that can arise in your professional practice and how these can be avoided. The main thing is to uphold your professional integrity. Our focus will be on the use of mediation to resolve otherwise intractable issues. Thanks, Peter. Today we'll be revising what the general ethical obligations are and then the specific obligations that are relevant to CPAs in public practice and then to CPAs in business, with a particular emphasis on obligations that are relevant to disputes. We will then go over some of the contractual matters that members should deal with in their standard letters of engagement that will assist them in the event of a dispute arising. Then we will explain how mediation can be used by members and the reasons why it can be so helpful to them. And then finally we will discuss some case scenarios. First though, Although Peter and I would obviously disagree, it has been said that accountants are the witch doctors of the modern world and willing to turn their hands to any kind of magic. That was said by a lawyer, Lord Justice Harmon, a British judge. On the other hand, as no doubt you would know, William Shakespeare famously said, the first thing we do, let's kill all the lawyers. Today we hope both to assist in ensuring that accountants do not have a bad reputation with the public and to persuade you that it might be best, after all, not to kill all the lawyers. So to the general obligations, these are particularly important in the case of a dispute. A member of CPA Australia, as I'm sure you know, is required to proceed in accordance with APES 110 Code of Ethics for Professional Accountants, which we will call the code during this webinar. The fundamental principles behind both CPAs in private practice and those in business, requiring them to behave in a manner that ensures integrity, objectivity, 
professional competence and due care, confidentiality and professional behaviour. DPAs have an overarching obligation to act in the public interest rather than exclusively to satisfy the needs of any particular client or their employer. The conceptual framework governing how CPAs are to proceed is set out in paragraphs 100.6 to 100.11 of the Code. That framework involves the identification and evaluation of what's known as threats, then the development and application of what's called safeguards against threats, using consideration of issues and professional judgment. Again, threats and safeguards are defined terms under the code. The code then requires disengagement from the client if the threat cannot be eliminated or reduced by way of safeguards to an acceptable level of risk. risk. An acceptable level of risk is defined using what's called the third party test. This means a level at which a reasonable and informed third party would be likely to conclude weighing all the specific facts and circumstances available to the member at that time that compliance with fundamental principles is not compromised. Now what does all that mean? The test is similar to the legal notion of the reasonable man, which is used by lawyers in the context of negligence actions. It's a very flexible test, but it can be hard to apply. One of our aims today is to help members to better understand how to apply the acceptable level of risk test. The threats that a CPA is required to identify arise from a broad range of relationships and circumstances. They include a self-interest threat, that is where a CPA's judgment or behaviour is inappropriately influenced by either a financial or other interest. Then there's the self-review threat. That is where a CPA may not appropriately evaluate the results of previous judgment made or service performed by them, which is then relied on when forming a judgment as part of performing a current service. There's the advocacy threat. That is where a CPA may promote a client's or employer's position to the point that their objectivity is compromised. This is also, by the way, a threat that lawyers commonly face. Familiarity threat. That is where, due to a long or close relationship with a client or employer, the CPA is too sympathetic to their interests or too accepting of their work. Then there's the intimidation threat. That is where a CPA is deterred from acting objectively because of actual or perceived pressures including attempts to exercise undue influence over the CPA. One or more of those threats may be present in any particular situation concerning a dispute. CPAs in public practice must decide whether their objectivity can be maintained without interests in or relationships with a client or its directors, officers or employees such as, for example, where there is a family or close personal business relationship. Independence of mind and in appearance are fundamental to audit, review and other assurance engagements and for the observance of integrity and objectivity. Additional independence requirements for CPAs are to be found in the Corporations Act. We'll now turn to members' general ethical obligations in the case of a dispute. <clears throat> now, we've already heard these expressions that <clears throat> the words used are threats and safeguards, and you'll hear a lot more about that in the course of this presentation today. And the point is to eliminate or reduce threats to an acceptable level. And the safeguards are, can be found usually in those created by the profession, in legislation or regulation, and also safeguards in the work environment. An example of a safeguard that can be utilised by CPAs is a dispute resolution clause, which we will strongly recommend you insert in your letters of engagement. 
that would require uh, any dispute to be uh, sent to mediation. CPAs may also be required to resolve ethical conflicts. You'll see the paragraph numbers there. And the relevant factors include uh, ethical issues, some fundamental principles, established internal procedures, and alternative courses of action. And we will illustrate some of these principles when we come to case studies later in this presentation. So when you're uh, analysing an ethical conflict, one of the important things to make sure is that <coughs> the decisions are documented. Again, there's a reference to the paragraph number. If there's a significant conflict, it's likely that legal advice will be required. Note that confidentiality must be maintained at all times. That includes anonymous contact with CPPA, CPAA, or, and bear in mind there's also legal professional privilege when you're obtaining legal advice from a lawyer. Uh, ultimately, the test is if there's an ethical conflict that remains unresolved, then the best course for a CPA is to refuse to remain associated with the matter. In other words, instead of digging yourself into an even deeper hole, it's time to get out. In addition to the general principles set out in the previous slides, CPAs in public practice have specific duties and obligations created under Part B of the Code. They include, for example, to avoid or minimise conflicts of interest, which creates threats to compliance with various fundamental principles such as objectivity, confidentiality and professional behaviour. These can arise by way of business or financial interests or relationships with clients or third parties. Fees charged are also identified as a possible source of conflict of interest. For example, where a firm or individual CPA has undue dependence on total fees from a particular client, a self-interest threat will be created. Wherever there is a conflict of interest which arises, CPAs in public practice are in danger of failing to comply with their ethical obligations and may be exposed to disciplinary proceedings, litigation, loss of reputation and of course loss of business. This is amply demonstrated by the response to the Royal Commission into the banking sector. It really doesn't pay to be in the public eye for all the wrong reasons. An example of where a conflict of interest may arise is where a CPA may be representing two clients regarding the same matter who are in a legal dispute with each other, such as during divorce proceedings or the dissolution of a partnership. This is really the main area in which mediation may assist. In that case, the CPA could agree to provide relevant documents to the mediator and refer the parties to independent lawyers for advice and, if necessary, representation at the mediation. Let's now look at some examples of where conflict of interest may arise. And we're talking now about conflict in terms of not conflict as in dispute, but in a conflict in terms of people having different interests. One example is providing an assurance report for a licensor on royalties at the same time as you're providing uh, another party, uh, you're checking for the other party the correctness of the amounts payable. Another example is advising a client to invest in a business, if a CPA or a spouse has a financial interest. Providing strategic advice to a client where CPA or an associated entity has an interest in a major competitor. Advising two clients who are competing to acquire the same company. Or advising a client on the acquisition of the business in which the CPA or his or her firm is also interested in the client. Moving through, advising a client uh, in respect of a matter in which CPA has a vested financial interest, for example, getting a commission. And this is one of the critical points. You might sometimes ask yourself, 
how is it that good people can do bad things? And the answer is often linked to the way they're remunerated, in other words, the way they're paid. Be very wary about obtaining confidential information in the course of an audit and not using it for any ulterior purpose. An example of conflict of interest is acting for vendor and a purchaser in respect of the same transaction, or preparing evaluation of assets for parties who are in an adversarial position with respect to each other and with respect to those assets. In these scenarios, disciplinary and other proceedings may be unavoidable, so best avoided altogether. There are also some specific duties, in addition to the general principles. So it's <coughs> uh, it's in order. Well, it's it's required for a CPA to implement proper safeguards, and they may include obtaining legal advice if issues arise, or consider resigning if the threat cannot be eliminated or reduced an acceptable level. Conflict of interest may also arise where a CPA feels he or she is pressured to behave in a particular way that is inconsistent with fundamental principles. For example, uh, there might be pressure to act contrary to law, contrary to professional standards, might be pressure to facilitate unethical or illegal earnings, and the classic example there is perhaps a, uh, a tax agent who's under pressure to disclose as income in a tax return, income which that tax agent knows is understating the real income. Be very wary of not uh, misleading others or misrepresenting any relevant facts. The significance of the threat must be evaluated and safeguards applied to eliminate or reduce the threats to an acceptable level, if possible. So examples of safeguards include obtaining advice, where appropriate, from within the employing organisation or an independent professional advisor or CPA Australia or using a formal dispute resolution process within the employing organisation. So CPA members in business should, where possible, ensure that this issue is covered in the employment contracts of the employer, so that disputes with respect to conflicts of interest and other threats can be managed in a timely, confidential and cost-effective manner. Or the CPA could seek legal advice. Other issues of particular relevance for CPAs in business are the need to avoid acting improperly in relation to their or their family members' financial interests. For example, a self-interest threat may arise in relation to decisions concerning their eligibility for and value of a profit-related bonus. They cannot also manipulate information or use confidential information for their personal gain. Self-interest threats may also arise where inducements in the form of gifts, hospitality or preferential treatment are given to them, or where inappropriate appeals to friendship or loyalty are made to them. The nature, value and intent of the offer will affect the existence and significance of the threat. Overall, the case should be that a CPA cannot be bought or conned. We now turn to <coughs> contractual matters, resolution mechanisms in practice. The first point we make is that it's very important for CPAs in public practice to have engagement letters which set out mechanisms for dealing with disputes. Uh, of course, an engagement letter is more fundamental before you get to any dispute resolution issues. It should set out the scope of the work and also the basis of charging. Uh, but getting back to the mediation dimension, we recommend that every engagement letter have included in it a clear dispute mechanism process. 
That should also deal with issues like ownership and retention of documents. Uh, you, you hear the expression lien over documents, uh, which will be dealt with uh, in detail later on. That is some sort of protection for the CPA uh, where the CPA holds documents and, for example, a fee has not been paid. Uh, for example, the provision in the uh, retainer letter can provide for an independent nationally accredited mediator to be appointed and it can also provide sensibly that the CPA and the client will not take any legal action until the mediation has been conducted. The cost of the mediation is usually borne equally by the parties and in the event that there is a dispute about the selection of the mediator, there can be a, a provision to the effect that, for example, the mediator is to be appointed uh, by the chairman of the Victorian Bar. Retention and ownership of documents and other records, including liens over records, is one of the most contentious issues between clients and CPAs in public practice. A lien is simply a means simply means that a CPA claims the right to retain documents until fees are paid. It's vitally important to cover the retention and ownership of documents and other records, an example of which is those stored electronically by the accountant or by an external service provider as a cloud storage provider in the engagement letter. Where the engagement letter is silent on the ownership of documents and other records, the CPA must consider the nature and purpose of the work completed. That is, they must consider whether the CPA is acting as an agent of the client or as principal. In practice, determining whether a lien can or cannot in fact be claimed by a CPA or firm can be very problematic and we refer you to pages 13 to 15 of CPA Australia's Client Relationship Guide. Generally, if a CPA is acting as an agent, the documents and other records will belong to the client, whilst if they are acting as a principal, they will belong to the CPA or firm. Again, generally, primary documents such as books of account, invoices, receipts and journals, tax returns, notices of assessment, the final financial statements and letters of advice belong to the client, whilst working papers of the CPA or firm belong to them. As you all know, your member obligations require you to establish appropriate systems for quality control in relation to complaints and allegations. And I refer you to paragraph 119 of APES 320 concerning con quality control for firms. One of the things set out in that paragraph is that as part of that process, the firm shall establish clearly defined channels for firm's personnel to raise any concerns in a manner that enables them to come forward without fear of reprisals, that is some kind of whistleblower provision. Mediation can be included in your quality control system as one of your dispute resolution mechanisms. We now have a polling question. Linda, could you open that up, please? I'm assuming that Linda has opened that up. So the webinar delegates are being asked, have you ever been involved in a mediation? And the response is no or yes. If it was yes, then it, was it conducted by a nationally accredited mediator? And if it was yes, did it concern a service performed by a CPA? Mary Ann, just letting you know we're collecting those results now and I'm about to display those results for you and there we go. Oh, 80% no. So 80% say no, they haven't been involved in a mediation, which is interesting. 4% um, say yes, they have been involved in a mediation. Another 4% say yes, 
and it was conducted by a nationally accredited mediator, which is good. And 0% say yes, and it concerned a service performed by a CPA, which is also interesting. Presumably that means that the service was performed by some other professional or concerned some sort of business dispute perhaps for one of their clients. Now move on to mediation for typical disputes. Some of the typical scenarios uh, that CPAs will come across include the following. Uh, claims that the, the fees were excessive, work was done outside the retainer, errors, delays, overlooked notices, or even complaints that the CPA was rude. Incidentally, uh, rudeness is one of the main complaints against lawyers, which we, <laughs> which we have uh, but I'm sure it's misplaced. Uh, in relation to the location of the registered office, I have seen some absolute disasters where the registered office is the office of the CPA, and the CPA has received notices, for example, of statutory demand, which he or she has not passed on to the client, with disastrous consequences, and even worse, where notices have been ignored, and ASIC has been registered a company, where that company might be the owner of the premises from which a business is conducted. So <clears throat> that's something to be very wary about. Also, where there's disputes between uh, two or more of the CPA's clients, and we'll come to a case study about that a bit later on. Uh, in my experience, the CPA is often the first port of call when disputes arise, for example, between clients. And it is of critical importance for a CPA to avoid the appearance of uh, any bias. Uh, for example, a bias in favour of one client against another. You'll see that uh, there are examples of conflict of interest where a CPA uh, is involved in a dispute between clients who are partners, or uh, another common way is there's a matrimonial issue between a husband and a wife, and the CPA has been effectively the family, mm -hmm. or where there's a fee dispute. Uh, also, where there's been a change of professional appointment, for example, where a CPA has been sacked by a client, then uh, that sort of thing can be, uh, that sort of dispute can be referred to mediation, as can a dispute between partners in a firm or partner, a dispute between an employer and an employee. Now, the next slide, this is just a photograph. It features Kerry Nichol, who's a very experienced needed mediator, here's the one in the middle, and this was taken at the Bar Mediation Centre in William Street, which is uh, a centre which is available for hiring, for, conduct, for conducting uh, mediations in a neutral venue. Moving through, uh, this is now fundamentally what is mediation all about? Disputes can be resolved in a number of ways. Litigation is one, mediation is another. Litigation, of course, involves cost. It involves risk, distress for the parties, and unwanted publicity because uh, uh, litigation is usually conducted in open court. And of course, if the matter goes to court, there's an imposed solution by contrast, in a mediation, there can be a consensual uh, outcome reached. I'll come back to the, moment, the mention of cost for a moment. You may, you may recall the French philosopher Voltaire once declared that he was only broke twice in his life, once when he lost a court case and once when he won one. And that's important because you need to understand that even a successful uh, piece of litigation can involve expenditure of costs, even on the part of the successful party. Moving through, 
The costs typically involved with a mediation involve, for example, preparation of documents, identification of issues. There'll be a cost of the mediator, which is usually shared between the parties, cost of hiring premises, legal advice if the parties are to be represented. Uh, and bear in mind that mediations are confidential processes so that by contrast with open court where your competitors, the press, external parties can come along and watch in a mediation it is entirely confidential and uh, critically in a mediation there can be negotiation of flexible outcomes. If the matter goes to court, someone's going to win, someone's going to lose. The loser will probably end up paying two sets of costs. The judge can't split the difference. There'll be a winner and a loser. Uh, but you can do all those sorts of things in a mediation. And again, importantly, with the mediation, you can achieve certainty. The matter can be finished on that day rather than drag on for weeks or months. The parties in a mediation are assisted in the process of mediation by the independent mediator who is required to be impartial and who controls the procedure. And this helps to reduce the aggression and stress that might otherwise arise. And it helps the parties to concentrate their efforts on devising possible solutions. There's a national scheme and under that scheme the barristers, solicitors, psychologists and social workers and the like can become accredited as mediators. Accreditation is important as it means that the mediator has the qualifications and experience to become accredited and to maintain that accreditation. For example, in relation to barristers, the applications for renewal are made every two years and need to be supported by reference to sufficient hours acting as the mediator rather than just representing clients at a mediation and by attaining sufficient CBT points. So lawyers very often act for parties in mediations. They represent them and they help them negotiate and they document any agreement that's reached. But there are only a small number of lawyers who are accredited to act as the mediator of a dispute between the parties. That person controls the process and assists all of the parties to the dispute. The emphasis of a mediation is on what the parties can live with and not on one party winning and the other losing. The mediator will listen to what each of the parties really wants. Mediations require proper preparation, not only by the parties but also by the mediator. And this involves what's called an intake session, usually by way of a phone call to each of the parties before the mediation takes place. In the intake session, the mediator will typically discuss what needs to be done with the parties and set dates for the provision of documents and lists of issues and statements of parties' positions. Once the mediation is being conducted, there's typically a joint session, although that may not be the case if there is a lot of anger between the parties or there's some other reason, such as domestic violence. And in the joint session, if it does proceed, the parties or their lawyers state their case. It's not a mini trial, but it's a straightforward airing of issues and positions. The parties then break into separate rooms for what's called private sessions. They separate and the mediator assists by visiting each in turn and relaying any settlement offers. Once a dispute is settled, the terms of the agreement and any release are then documented by the parties or if they're represented by lawyers, by their lawyers. Where there is anger, the mediator understands that this is often motivated by fear or the need to control. And so investigates what the real concern is whilst maintaining control of the pro process. For example, keeping the parties in separate rooms 
steps are also taken by the mediator to, to reframe the issues in neutral language rather than language which is loaded with emotion, argument and accusation. Mediation agreements are signed at the beginning of the process and bind the parties. They allow the mediator to stop the mediation at any time. Indeed, the CPA or client can do this also, as it's an entirely consensual process. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, <clears throat> these are two barristers talking about the advantages of sending things to mediation. They've got a vested interest in this. Uh, to a very limited extent, that's true. But what we have in mind uh, is to protect the best interests of the client, and frankly, we make more money from litigation than we do from mediation. So we, we get paid to run cases. Uh, but <clears throat> what we're saying is it really is in the best interest of the client to exhaust the mediation process first so that litigation is very much a last resort. Uh, it's important to bear in mind too the real role of a mediator. A lawyer mediator is not there to give advice but is there to probe the issues and to work out what's doable, what's not, and provide something of a reality check. Because quite apart from the merits as a matter of law, people are unpredictable and witnesses can end up saying something different from what different in court from what they told their lawyers. It is an unpredictable, risky uh, business, that is, that of litigation. There are some uh, vague notions of justice that the clients often want to achieve, and that's where the reality check does come in, because sometimes uh, those ideas are completely unrealistic. And frankly, barrister mediators are in a better position to give some kind of assessment about what's realistic and what's not. Now, we have another polling question. Question. If you have been involved in a mediation, did the mediation assist the parties to understand the other party's position? Yes or no? That's not a popular question. Well, but only 20% only, only have been involved. Mm. That's a small sample. The poll has ended. Yeah, I'm just uh, calculating all of those results and I'll display that in the screen about five seconds for you all. Uh, yeah. Understand. <laughs> okay. There's a bit of work to be done here. All right. Now there's a next polling question. <clears throat> Could we have the next one, please? If you have been involved in a mediation, was the mediation successful in resolving the dispute or moving the parties closer to a resolution? Yes or no? We still have about 10 seconds left of this poll to make sure that your um, your actual response is calculated. Please make sure you do hit that submit button. Just got a couple of people. There we go. Okay, I'll display those results in about 15 seconds for you all. So, 
We're now going to move on to some case scenarios. But first, when a CPA member has a conflict of interest between clients and needs to remain impartial in the dispute, it's important to consider various things. CPAs often act in situations where a dispute arises between two of their clients. For example, acting for a party where one becomes a vendor and the other a purchaser and also acting for partners in a partnership or spouses in a marriage. CPAs in business may become aware that their external accountants have such a conflict of interest. At the first sign of a dispute arising, leading to a conflict of interest arising, CPAs should consider calling in a mediator. This is in effect applying a safeguard to the various threats of ethical dilemmas and possible ethical breaches. It also provides a CPA with a better chance of retaining the clients in the future. There will be an unbiased and effective dispute resolution mechanism implemented. We will now discuss two case scenarios. A conflict of interest um, dispute could involve spouses or family members or a partnership or quasi-partnership, shareholders and directors of a company unit holders in a unit trust, they may be heading for a business or personal divorce. Now one scenario where a CPA may find themselves in difficulty is if they act for a very successful professional and his partnership that earns income from the professional activities as well as from property investments. The fees earned by that CPA from that partnership may be significant as a proportion of the CPA's practice and therefore um, a strong relationship may develop over time between the CPA and the professional. Now imagine that the professional services client also has interests in various family investments which he's inherited in equal shares with his brothers. He's persuaded them to use the CPA's services. The CPA then begins to act for the three brothers in relation to their family businesses. He obtains instructions from his initial client rather than the other two brothers. A dispute then arises because the other two brothers say they are being given what's called the mushroom treatment, that is, kept in the dark and fed rubbish. What is the ethical issue or issues here? Well firstly, there's a self-interest due to the fees earned from the First Brothers Professional Services Business Partnership being such a large portion of the CPA's business. Secondly, there's also a threat to the CPA's objectivity and impartiality due to his close personal relationship which he's built up over time with the First Brother. What can be done in such a situation? First, we would suggest that uh, at the initial conference, the question of who is giving instructions be sorted out and that that be inserted into a letter of engagement. It may be that all of the brothers being equal directors and equal shareholders or equal beneficiaries all want to um, be consulted and to give instructions to the CPA. If that's the case, the CPA should then consider the practical methods of achieving that, for example by circular emails or video conferences and the like. If a dispute of that nature arose and wasn't settled at the outset as to who was going to give instructions, a mediation might help facilitate a resolution of those issues and in doing so increase the trust the two other brothers have in the CPA. The result would be, hopefully, that the dispute is resolved and that both business ventures are retained as clients by the CPA. I'm going to deal with a fact situation in which there is a deadlock between two people in business and it doesn't really matter for this purpose whether it's a partnership, a company or unit trust. It's effectively, we'll call it, call it a quasi-partnership. They've had a falling out the business is paralysed, something has to be done. The matter is referred to mediation and the mediator will often write something like this up on the whiteboard. 
you have five options. One, A buys out B. Two, B buys out A. All very sensible so far. And an interesting tactic which the mediator might even suggest is if the parties agree a business is worth, say, a million dollars, half is half a million dollars, A might say to B, well, I'm prepared to buy or sell for half a million. And that locks them into a very awkward tactical decision. It's a bit hard to say no to that. So one option, A buys B, or second option, B buys A. Option three, they could combine and agree to sell the business and split up the proceeds. If all comes to nothing, a liquidator can be appointed. Although a mediator is not permitted to give advice, uh, one thing a mediator would say in a case like that is, if a liquidator is appointed, there's a guarantee that everybody's going to lose, except the liquidator for fees. And the fifth possibility is to effectively do nothing or next to nothing, find out what the dispute is really about. Often it's because one of the partners will be saying, well, I'm actually contributing more to this business than another. Probably sounds familiar to a lot of CPAs, uh, both in respect of perhaps their own businesses and their clients' businesses, in which case it might be a, a relatively simple matter of giving somebody a pay rise and moving on. Turning now to a different kind of dispute, what happens where there's a fee dispute? First is check the terms of the engagement letter. Next, think about whether there's going to be an ongoing relationship. Does the CPA want to keep this client? In which case, I have a serious talk about what the possibilities are. Otherwise, sometimes a CPA doesn't need to keep the client at all. Remember the advice from an experienced accountants, if you're not losing a few clients every year, you're not charging enough. The mediator will uh, establish as far as he or she can, as well as he or she can, what the real issue is. Sometimes the issue is not just the amount of fees, but uh, the amount of fees because uh, a lot of work has been done by uh, employees, and there might be a turnover of employees, the client gets sick of being asked the same questions by different people. In those circumstances, a CPA might simply reduce the fees by reference to the input of one of those uh, employees. So concentrate on identifying what the real issue is. Do you want to keep the client or not? In which case, have a serious talk about resolving it. And once it is resolved, always obtain a release and the legal analogy is that lawyers, when they're suing for fees, have to quantify them. The quantification often ends up in the cost court, and it's very often at that stage that the client comes up and makes an allegation out of nowhere that there's been negligence on the part of the lawyer, therefore the fees are not payable. Okay. Another scenario uh, is where there's a change in professional appointments and a dispute arises relating to an exercise of a lien over documents. CPAs should consider whether the engagement letter covers the issue of a lien over documents and also other records in the case of unpaid fees. If there is such a provision, is there a dispute resolution clause in the engagement letter that requires the referral of the dispute to mediation? If there is no such provision in an engagement letter covering ownership, but there is one for mediation, the mediator will assist the parties to consider the nature and purpose of the accounting services provided and the nature of the documents or other records, as well as third party agreements, so that the parties can better understand whether a lien can be claimed, and if so, over what documents or other records. It will also assist the parties to determine what the relevant fees covered by any lien are, either fees in general or fees just for specific work. This then aids the parties to better assess the merits of settling the dispute. So in summary, 
CPAs need to be able to recognise potential conflicts of interest or ethical threats and where possible should provide for various matters that arise in disputes such as ownership of and liens over documents as well as dispute resolution mechanisms in their letters of engagement. That makes life a whole lot easier. Then if a dispute does arise, the primary focus should not be on the possible loss of the client. Instead, the CPA should identify the problem and take steps both at the time of the engagement and at the time when the dispute arises to resolve the issues or disputes in a professional, unbiased and cost-effective way. Mediation is a way of providing one of the safeguards against ethical problems in such situations, which protects the CPA and their firm's reputation and maximises the chance of not losing a client or alternatively where it's unavoidable, disengaging with the client in the least damaging and most cost-effective way. Now at the moment, unfortunately, we don't have a national um, link that we can provide for mediators, but the Victorian Bar is working with the National Mediator Standards Board to create one. At the moment, it's necessary to go to the various state organisations and they're listed on page 48 of the slide. And next we have a list of the resources which are set out there. So, um, yes, so thank you, Peter. I just wanted to just quickly add in these resources are available on CPA Australia's website. So it's the client engagement template, the client relationship guide that was referred to um, during the presentation, um, the code, uh, risk management strategies, and a few articles, um, when to call in the media, mediator, sorry, not, not media, um, and how to work it out um, in mediation. So um, just wanted to just read out a few of the, oh, there's actually one question here from Michael. Um, so he's just explained his situation. He said that we attempted to have a mediation, three mediations that all failed. The defendant wanted to be in a separate room and wanted the mediation to be conducted by telephone. We agreed. He then said he was intimidated and requested the matter be cancelled. The second time he requested ridiculous settlement terms but conduct the mediation in a separate room and the media mediator had to walk between the two rooms. Final mediation, he didn't turn up to the mediation. So mediation does not the manipulative type of defendants. The defendant has now been bankrupted. The plaintiff paid for three mediations which resulted in nil result, result, only frustration. How would you deal with unethical defendants that look only to cancel mediation and legal representatives that want to only extend and frustrate? And yes, nationally accredited mediators were engaged, they also became very frustrated. So let's open up to Peter and Marianne to your thoughts on this particular question. Unfortunately that situation does occur, particularly with people who either really know the system and know how it operates and therefore how to frustrate the system, um, often seen in debt recovery situations, insolvency situations. Um, the first problem that I can see there was that he wanted to conduct a mediation by telephone. Obviously, um, you can't exert much pressure on someone to settle if they're at the end of a telephone. They really must be there in person and ordinarily the mediator should require that. Peter, do you have anything to say? Uh, I'm glad you mentioned the telephone because I my personal view is it's near impossible to, to to resolve a serious dispute over the telephone. I'm not talking now about minor matters. We can have a chat about it. It's it's very important to have the people present in the same room. Sometimes, regrettably, there are people who just won't listen to reason. Uh, I wasn't sure if Michael was uh, if the if the difficult person in that matter raised by Michael had legal advice or not. But of course, sometimes. That these people can can even annoy their own legal advisors and not talk to them. The technical expression 
in use in courts now as SRLs, self-represented litigants. Mm. They're the bane of the court system and sometimes they just want their day in court. Yes, you're right, mediation doesn't work every time, but our, what we're saying is you really need to give it your best shot. And sometimes if you persevere, it, it, it can work at the end, but you've got to give it your best shot, as I say, and do your best. Uh, but you're right, some cases have to go to court. Something that I would add is that uh, three times to mediation is too many. Um, we're suggesting that sometimes in the appropriate situation you would have mediation before proceeding, legal proceedings are issued. Um, otherwise it is now the fashion and inevitably you will be referred to mediation by a judge once litigation is instigated. Um, so <clears throat> there can very often be the cost of paying for two mediations. However, in the context of running a case, it is a tiny percentage of the cost. So where it works, it's definitely worth doing. Just on the point of three mediations, I've actually just been in a case where there was a deadlock between two people in business. There were three mediations and the matter then went to court and it w the, the court was about to wind up the company. We got the matter stood down and we resolved it at that time. Yes, yeah, sometimes. Sometimes a party needs uh, a bit of a threat hanging over them before they'll start to become more reasonable. It's human nature, unfortunately. Just adding, oh sorry. Oh, just, at, um, just of interest, you've mentioned that usually the judge will, will also um, recommend mediation. What happens to mediation that's happened before, um, before it goes into litigation phase? Does that get considered by the judge as well? Just two points. The judge, in Victoria at least, it's more than just we'll often do it. It's almost inevitable mm. that before you get a trial date, there'll be a mediation. Pretty well always. Right. Uh, I think your question, the second part of your question is that if there's already been a mediation, mm -hmm. the judge take that into account? Mm -hmm. Usually yes, but it doesn't mean there won't be another one. Okay. Yes. Because you're further down the track, people have spent more money, they've read more documents, and hopefully they'll have a better idea of what it's really about. Great. Okay, well that concludes our session for today. So I did want to thank both Peter and Marianne for joining us today. Um, it was really great to have the insight into this, into the mediation world because there's a lot of accountants out there that don't know what that involves. So thank you very much for spending some time with us today. My pleasure. And Linda, you. you're welcome. And Linda, I'm just handing it back to you. Uh, to conclude this session. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'll second that. Thank you very much to Peter and Marianne for a fantastic webinar. Also, a special thanks as well to Tricia, Michelle, and Sharon for your support. Um, and finally, a special thanks to everyone for your participation as well as for your attendance today. That does conclude today's webinar. To exit, please click on the cross on the top right of your screen, just letting you know upon exiting, you'll be automatically redirected to a feedback form. Now, the feedback form only takes about 30 seconds to complete. However, feedback's really been beneficial for CPA Australia as well as our panel of presenters today as well. We certainly review all of your feedback so we'd really, really appreciate if you could take the time. Okay, just having a look at the chat box, there's no final questions or anything like that, just a lot of thank yous. So thank you once again to Peter and, as well as Marianne and thank you to everyone for taking the time to do that as well. What I might do now is I'll pop on the music as you all exit and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Thanks everyone. <laughs>